right. Well, I think that we can all agree with Dwight that identity theft is not a joke. I'm hoping that we have at least a few Office fans out there, myself included, <laughs> as I'm <laughs> new to the show. Uh, we're just going to dive into some business email compromise and then how to detect it. My name is Mac. I'm a detection engineer for Red Canary. And outside of being a proud woman in STEM, I am also a marathon runner. So maybe that's why my favorite episode was the fun run. <laughs> I'm Rachel Schwalk. I'm also a detection engineer at Red Canary. And outside of work, you can usually find me reading a book. So we will dive right into it. What is business email compromise? So this is a cyber attack where criminals will gain access to a company's email system. Uh, adversaries that use it to scam employees into making unauthorized transactions are sharing or stealing sensitive information are both. Uh, why do they care about e email inboxes? Well, it is because they contain a treasure trove of valuable information and email addresses are among the most critical identifiers in the corporate world. So gaining access to these inboxes not only offers an adversary access to all this juicy sensitive information, but they can also impersonate legitimate user accounts and carry out all kinds of different malicious activities for financial gain. And this may sound complicated, so I'm going to pass it over to Mac to explain things where even Michael Scott could understand them. <laughs> yeah, so to break it down to a level Michael Scott can understand, you should care about this because adversaries are utilizing this attack method and they're successful doing so. So they're initializing wire fraud, they're stealing sensitive information, and they're dropping malware. And to care means that you can limit your organization's risk. So listening to this talk is a good step because Rachel and I know a lot of indicators of business email compromise are detectable, and we're going to show you how to do that. All right, so we're going to talk about initial access first. Adversaries are gaining initial access mainly through the following. So in that first box, spoofing an email account, they're using slight variations on legitimate addresses. As you can see, I have two examples. One is my first and last name at the company. And the other one, just by adding another S at the end of my last name, it kind of still masks it. Um, it's not easily detectable. And hopefully, via um, an attacker, they're hoping that you would just let that slide. Box number two, they're using phishing, which tricks the users by sending messages appearing to be from a trusted sender. So adversaries are looking to get the user to reveal confident information. And then finally, um, that third box, looking at infiltrating company networks and gaining access to data by dropping malware. So it's also used to gain undetected um, access to a victim's data. Here are some examples. So the following scenarios that happened to real victims, all the messages were fake, and in each case, an absurd amount of money were sent to adversaries. So a CEO asks their assistant to purchase dozens of gift cards. They want the serial numbers sent right away. A lot of times this could be seen as text messages in a phishing format or email spoofing the CEO's address. Then we have what appears to be a partnering vendor sends an invoice asking finance to update what billing information they have for their company. This would be spoofing as the email appears to be from a partnering vendor. However, there's a slight change in that address. An email is sent out by the head of human resources asking employees to download the new employee handbook. Again, maybe this could look like spoofing the email address of that head of human resources, but it also could be um, dropping malware via that download link that they're um, asking to open. And we have an employee emails HR asking to update their payroll information and change their banking information. This again could be spoofing that employee's email in hopes to not be noticed by that HR representative. And finally, we have an employee appearing to be from IT, emails you about some weird behavior on your computer. They send you a link. The link just wants you to put your credentials in and log in, and then IT is just going to help you fix that issue. Well, that's going to be probably a phishing link looking to harvest those credentials. Do any of these sound familiar? I bet so. 
So I'm sure you're thinking to yourself, well, my company's safe. We use extra security measures. We have multi-factor authentication enabled. Well, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but adversaries are using MFA bypass methods. So these are techniques that adversaries use to evade security layers provided by MFA. So like one-time passwords, digital tokens, uh, biometric authentication. They're bypassing that to gain unauthorized access to sensitive data and systems. So some techniques that are being used to bypass MFA and two-factor authentication are as following. So you have disabling and weakening multi-factor authentication. So that's when an attacker modifies a configuration to disable or weaken an organization's ability to enforce MFA policies, such as modifying maybe trusted IP configs. You have exploiting authorized MFA exceptions. So that's when an adversary identifies accounts operating without MFA requirements. You have stolen SAML signing certificates. So that was used in SolarWinds breach, which is probably why it might sound familiar to y'all. This is when an attacker has stolen the private key to sign certs or has forged a key. You have session reuse. So that is the compromise of systems that already have authenticated uh, session. So that's eliminating that need to re-authenticate. And finally, directly bypassing MFA. So that means that adversaries have persistent access without MFA. So for those of you relying solely on MFA, Michael may be correct, but I'm gonna hand it over to Rachel to talk about an authentication method that may have slipped through the cracks within your environment where adversaries can utilize directly bypassing MFA and she can help you out with that. Yeah, well, went too far, okay. So we're gonna talk about legacy authentication protocols. So this is when uh, the adversary, like Matt mentioned, would have a chance to directly bypass MFA. Uh, legacy authentication allows applications to send usernames and passwords with every authentication request. And you may think you don't have legacy authentication enabled or um, that you have MFA enabled for every single user, but Misconfigurations and unexpected exceptions occur quite frequently, which makes legacy authentication a very easy attack vector for adversaries. Uh, these modern authentication standards like OAuth 2.0, they prevent applications from directly handling the username and passwords, and they'll instead route the user authentication through an identity provider such as uh, Intra ID, which was formerly known as Azure Active Directory, uh, and so that's going to be like referring to these older protocols such as POP, SMTP. Uh, these don't allow for rich user interaction. Uh, it, don't, it doesn't allow for multi-factor. It doesn't allow for device verification. So because it doesn't allow for any of it, it's a low effort for adversaries to try to exploit that. Uh, it can just rely on accounts that maybe fell through the cracks on getting MFA set up. So if it isn't explicitly enabled, this is one vector that is an opportunity for attackers. Uh, they can perform password spraying against accounts, uh, which is when adversaries just have a list of usernames and common passwords. They might get usernames just from OSINT on LinkedIn, uh, gathering all of the potential users and trying to formulate the username uh, that you might use in your organization and common passwords so you know if passwords are rotated like every four months if one person does the whole you know spring 2023 fall 2023 winter 2023 scenario where they create that common fault uh, and predictability and their password that leads to the adversary gaining access to that account and another thing is that Microsoft sometimes has legacy authentication in certain applications, which we will talk about that because that is, ties into our resource owner password credentials, also known as ROPC. Resource owner password credentials, it is quite a mouthful, um, but it is one of the authentication protocols that it doesn't allow the user to interact with the identity provider 
So there is no way to accomplish MFA, such as number matching or SMS one-time passwords. So a typical client that supports the ROPC flow will accept a username and password from the resource owner, so the user, and they will just send it straight along to the identity provider to exchange that for an access token. Uh, and Microsoft allows these older applications that rely on legacy authentication to switch in real time to OAuth 2.0 using this flow. So it's kind of a, a way to upgrade to modern authentication on the fly without an application developer actually uh, updating to support more secure uh, Auth 2.0 flows like the authorization grant. So adversaries will target the, this flow because it's a avenue for targeting and gaining access to Azure AD accounts that don't enforce MFA. Uh, ties back to that password spray scenario uh, and the applications that are shipped by default by Microsoft uh, and every tenant will allow for this ROPC flow, such as Microsoft Teams and Outlook Mobile. There's quite a handful of them that support it by default. So if you haven't turned it off, by default, it's on. And how do you identify if this is being targeted in your environment? You would see this BAV2 ROPC user agent. BAV2 ROPC stands for Basic Authentication Version 2 Resource Owner Password Credentials. Quite a mouthful with that one. If you thought ROPC was bad, this is like what? But so this is actually the mechanism that allows these old applications that continue to rely on, uh, on legacy authentication to switch in real time to OAuth 2.0 using the ROPC flow. So when you're looking through authentication logs, you would see BAV2 ROPC as the user agent. Uh, and so in, if you're not sure what that means, that's like what identifies the operating system and browser or application being used during authentication. So you might sometimes normally see like a Windows device using a Chrome browser uh, you, in that user agent string. And how does it relate to BEC? Well, adversaries will use these credentials, uh, but they create these password spray lists. Uh, they'll send those out and any of those, you know, you might see like thousands of failures coming from the BAB2 ROPC user agent. And that's just because they are spraying all these accounts because uh, they see that that is a valid form of authentication in your environment. If they do get a password correct, and that user does have MFA turned on, they will receive an invalid grant error. So the user will not get sent an MFA notification, but the attacker will still know that that password is valid. So that's one way that the user would never even know that their credentials were stolen, that they're being used um, because they don't get that MFA notification. So it's a good idea to monitor any logins that you see with this user agent um, because it's not going to be super typical for uh, your users to authenticate using a legacy protocol. Uh, so you can filter logins within the intra ID portal that you can use that single factor authentication filter, uh, or you can use ROPC as the authentication method to filter on as well. So that will kind of just help you baseline if the activity is occurring frequently within your environment. And I'm gonna pass it over to Mac to explain more about these authentication flows. Yeah, so um, like Rachel said, the resource owner password credential, the ROPC flow, it's one of the standard flows to find in OAuth 1. So the ROPC flow is a single request. And in this flow, the client first collects the resource owner's credentials and then sends them to the auth authorization server. So um, as part of the request, the client also includes its own credentials. The request is an HTTP POST request with the client's credentials either in the body or in the authorization header. The server then responds with an access token and optionally a refresh token. Immediately after a successful request, the client securely discards users' credentials from memory and then never saves them. So then um, on the flip side, 
the this diagram it shows a high level view of an authentication flow using OAuth. So the auth code flow requires a user agent that supports redirection from the authorization server back to your application. For example, like a web browser, desktop, or mobile application operated by like a user to sign into your app and then access their data. So apps using OAuth 2.0 authorization code flow acquire an access token to include in requests resources protected by an identity platform, so typically like an API. Apps can also request new IDs um, and access tokens for previously authenticated entities by using that refresh mechanism. We could go on quite a bit about authentication flow, but the show must go on. And just like Kelly Kapoor from The Office said, I talk a lot, uh, so I've learned to just tune myself out. So I'll just hand it very right back to Rachel to talk about AITM. Yeah, adversary and the middle attacks, also just called AITM. Uh, these also used to be called man in the middle. Um, it's where attackers position themselves between a user and the service that they're trying to authenticate to, to steal credentials. Uh, and they intercept that MFA code to capture the session cookie. So I'll run through a quick uh, example scenario. Uh, this is a indirect proxy scenario and an indirect proxy uh, Unlike the reverse proxy adversary in the middle, there are no HTTP packets proxy between the target and the actual website. So since the phishing website is set up by the attackers, they have more control to modify the displayed content according to the phishing scenario. So in this instance, a phishing email is received and the user clicks the phishing link. So the user then goes to the attacker controlled website and the attacker initiates authentication with the target site. So think of like the Microsoft login site. The user will enter their credentials into that attacker site and the attacker will capture those and send it to the actual Microsoft website. And then that target site will prompt for MFA. And so the attacker will then dynamically create a forged MFA site uh, to get the user to input their code. Uh, the attacker will input that additional authentication and they will receive the session cookie. And the user is redirected to another page. They don't know that anything wrong has occurred and the attacker now is able to bypass MFA because they just have the actual cookie that they need to be that user. And you may think that it sounds like a really complicated attack, um, but there's actually quite a few just like open source AITM phishing kits available. Um, so, you know, there's videos showing how to do this. There's all these tools that are just like able to be used out of the box. Um, you know, it does say don't use this for evil just for educational purposes only. So, you know, everybody obeys that of course. Um, and you can also, if you want it even easier than this, there are AITM kits available to purchase for like $400 and it's basically point and click uh, to really easily get these out there uh, with a lot of control of, over what the user will see. So how can you help prevent these attacks? There are a couple ways. Uh, you can go in and disable legacy authentication. Um, there are a couple of PowerShell one-liners here on how to set the uh, Exchange SMTP authentication uh, to be false and turn off the basic authentication within the M365 admin center. Um, so like I said, how Microsoft by default allows some of these legacy authentication protocols, you have to go turn them off. You can also create conditional access policies. Uh, conditional access policies, they evaluate the sign-in request using additional identity-driven signals like user or group membership, IP location information, device status, and they're enforced for any suspicious logins that meet that criteria that you're looking for. So you can require a device to be marked compliant. So that will require a user to register the device 
and won't allow unregistered devices to log into your environment. And if you can, setting trusted locations is also extremely useful. Um, it's easier if you know very specific countries that users will be logging in from, and then you can just deny all other areas. Um, uh, when you're an international company, I know that's sometimes a little bit trickier, but maybe you can exclude a couple of really riskier uh, locations if possible. Um, and if the login is blocked by conditional access, the adversary would still know the sign-in was successful, but it would just go to a page saying like, you can't access this right now. So those credentials are still compromised and you may want to look for uh, logins that were blocked by conditional access in case you might want to still rotate those users' credentials. Uh, and another thing that you can do is ensure that all accounts have MFA enabled. There really are very frequently accounts that just fall through the cracks when you set out to enroll MFA for the whole user base. For whatever reason, there may just be a few accounts that actually don't ever get it turned on. So make sure that you definitely do have MFA enabled on all accounts. With this PowerShell one-liner, it'll identify any accounts that don't explicitly require MFA. And even with all the protections, it's not a matter of if, but when uh, account compromise can happen. And it's one of the most common attacks that we see. Um, so, you want to be prepared uh, when they do, and you know you're gonna have maybe the strange location login tip you off, or the BAP to ROPC user agent logging into an account. Mac will walk you through what else to look for to sniff out account compromise. I love that I can actually like in my head I can hear Michael Scott saying that it's happening. <laughs> Honestly, iconic. Um, but yeah, we're, so we're going to go over what to look for if you believe you've been compromised. Starting with MFA method modifications. So you might notice an addition of a new MFA method, specifically one that doesn't require reauthorization by default. That's going to be that MFA bypass that we were talking about earlier. We've also seen attackers add their number to the MFA method so that they can just send themselves that verification and get through security measures that way. Next, mailbox delegation. So that's listed under MITRE attack technique T1098, account manipulation, um, additional email delegate permissions. So bad actors or adversaries may also assign mailbox folder permissions through individual folders, permissions, or roles. This could look like full access to a mailbox, so the bad actor can open, view, add, and remove contents. Send as access, which means they can send messages directly as that mailbox or group. And then finally, send on behalf, which which means that they can send messages, um, but be able to show the information as coming from the mailbox or user. So note that any widespread phishing email or email sent to payroll departments asking to update direct deposit information is another huge clue. You wanna pay attention to that. Uh, next, we have created an entire slide to this, but um, another event to look for is gonna be email rule creation. So one of the most frequent techniques adversaries leverage in business email compromise schemes is to create email forwarding rules. So email rules allow you to move, flag, and respond to email messages automatically. Many users create email rules to do just their day-to-day -day tasks and manage like the enormous amounts of emails that they receive, right? We can all repeat, relate to that. And because of that, detecting a malicious rule can become a challenge because there's most likely going to be a lot of events if you're um, trying to collect those. But adversaries look to create new email rules in order to evade detection. So they tend to write rules to move messages to less viewed built-in folders. So a lot of what we see is like archived or RSS feeds. Um, adversaries also try to mark messages as read in hopes that you'll just skip those emails and miss them entirely. They're also likely to forward emails to external adversary owned addresses to just collect information and data. So the most important email rule operations to watch specifically within Microsoft's unified audit logs is gonna be new inbox rule, set inbox rule, uh, remove inbox rule, disable inbox rule, update inbox rule, and then set mailbox. 
So in the past year, we've identified and detected numerous compromises where adversaries abuse valid credentials to silently modify a victim's mailbox setting. <laughs> so don't worry about those. Like Dwight said, we say bring it on. Rachel and I are going to provide you with some detection opportunities to catch adversaries attempting business email compromise. So Rachel, it's all yours. Awesome. So what kind of email rules are these adversaries going to make? Uh, Matt kind of hit on it. You know, they're all about evading uh, their detection. They don't want to lose that access to that user's inbox. So they are going to move messages to RSS feeds. They're going to move to archive, deleted items, conversation history, monitor any email rules that have that move message filter, and they contain one of those folders. They are hiding from the user because they're counting on, you know, like most people, that person not checking their RSS feeds folder. Look for simple rule names. So if a rule has a non-descriptive name, such as A, R, period, just like one character, look for those names. Uh, I have some regex there. Uh, it's, you know, I don't like regex, but it's there for you to use in your email rules so you can look for just single character rule names. Uh, forwarding to external addresses is also extremely common because if they lose access to that inbox, they are still going to want to have your emails sent to them from their own controlled address. They can still get that information. So if an email rule contains the forward to or redirect to, and it doesn't contain your domain, that's one way to look for those. Uh, you could also filter on if an email rule uh, has forward to or redirect to and goes to like a widely used public email domain like Gmail or yahoo.com, stuff of that nature, uh, you can look for that. Some other things to look for. I know we're running on time, so I'll wrap it up quickly. We only have a couple more slides, but look for repetitive rule names. So a rule name that has like repeating A's, like A, 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 R, dot, 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 uh, some regex there, because again, they try to not use descriptive rule names. Like if it's a legitimate one, a person might put like move emails from newsletter to spam folder something of that nature, but an adversary is going to want it to be vague. So look for that. And the special characters is another one that we see a lot where a rule name is just like a semicolon or a string of special characters, like the exclamation point, the asterisk, and a semicolon. And suspicious message filters. So look for a rule word filter that contains either hacked, phishing, compromised, virus, a lot of times either trying to uh, remove emails from the user's attention that might be coming from like an IT department, giving a heads up that somebody was hacked or there might be phishing email going around. Uh, so we look for those. And if payroll, wire, direct deposit or invoice is mentioned, it could be an attempt to get Sensitive financial information, uh, they would likely send it to like payroll departments or HR. They might be like, hey, I want to update my direct deposit. So then HR gets that and they reply, okay, I did that, you know, and they don't want the user to see that reply that the direct deposit was updated. Key takeaways. So multi-factor should be explicitly required because legacy authentication uh, can be a way to route against MFA if it is not uh, explicitly required. So check with that with that PowerShell one-liner mentioned earlier. Monitor your email rules uh, because compromise is bound to happen even if you try to prevent it. Uh, so ensure you're ready by building out those detections for unusual email activity. And make sure to use conditional access policies to protect against those type of adversary in the middle attacks where they're just using stolen session cookies. So allowing only compliant devices and trusted location logins will help reduce your risk considerably. And we got the poll results. Results are in. It looks like the top is the dinner party. Yeah, yeah. Yep. 
I don't know why, but that one is just not coming to my head. Oh man, that, that was. Uh, now I feel like I, I, have I won't to go, go into it, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know we are at the question slide. We are over time a little bit, so if you asked a question, uh, we'll reach out offline to answer it. Um, so thank you guys for attending today. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Yep, we hope that we've left you with some actionable items that you can take back into your own environments, um, as well as some new information and resources that you can do some more research on your own. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you.